Good evening, Urbana. <laughs> Always want to say that. Sorry. It's October twelfth, five thirty-five. It is the monthly meeting of the Urbana Human Relations Commission. Can we please have a roll call? Aisha Soap. Eric Smith. Here. Peter Resnick. Here. Daniel Larson. Here. Lisa Mosley. Here. Carol Bar Bradford. Ruzwan Yudin. Fran Baker. Here. Thank you, Todd. Um, looking at the minutes from our September 14th meeting, are there any additions, corrections, updates that need to be made? Looks good. So we can move for approval. Move approval. I second it. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Public participation, seeing none, we can move on to old business. Todd, please, um, looking forward to the update on the non-biased police training. Sure. Um, so I'm asking you to block out dates um, right around the 15th, 16th, and 17th of December, particularly the 17th of December, which is a Saturday morning. Um, we know, I think we have pretty much in concrete that there's going to be a four-hour session there. Um, the community will be invited. The other sessions are still sort of in the point of formation, so I'll have more information on those later. Um, but this will be a nationally recognized speaker who was formerly a assistant chief of police who now uh, basically is a speaker who goes and works with communities and police agencies to facilitate greater understanding, greater empathy, um, also does some uh, things with uh, obviously non-biased policing, leadership development, some other things. But for us, he's going to be focusing on cultivating that relationship and non-biased policing. So we're looking forward to that. As we have more details, we will release them. Um, but, but certainly those are the dates that I'd like everyone to sort of start to pencil in that you that it would be good if you could be available for one of those dates particularly the 17th but also perhaps uh, one, one or two of the other dates also so we're talking december 15th 16th and 17th so that's oh. thursday friday saturday yes sir okay. and as we get more information as we get more um details solidified we will make those available any questions about that Oh, oh, the other thing is this. I, w I will say this. One very um, encouraging note is that he has asked to speak to um, basically a sub or a cross section of individuals from across the community before even getting here so that he can have a good idea of what the community issues are from a variety of different perspectives. And so we're currently compiling a list of, of individuals and in sort of contact information for him uh, uh, so that he can go ahead and get that accomplished. So it, it looks like he's, first of all, he has a great reputation. I've seen him. He's excellent. He's extremely dynamic. Um, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to it. And again, as we have more details, I'll be much more um, uh, forthcoming in, in regards to the identity of the person. I just want to make sure that we have everything ironed out before we do that. Any questions? Uh, it's related, but not specifically. Sure. Um, I just were, and I, this might not be the forum to, to bring this up, but I remember from our special meeting over the summer and the police chief talking about the need for more relationship building mm -hmm. with the whole community, specific sectors, 62 or 4 specifically. C in a couple, just said, can you give us an overview of what we currently do on that front? Or I know you're not. Again, yeah. you know what? I'm okay. Not, not the necessarily form. the best person to ask for all of the things because the police department certainly does a lot independently. Sure, um, they meet with neighborhood groups mm -hmm. pretty much constantly. Okay, um, but what I will say is that this event al also is meant sort of as a conversation starter yeah, for no, that absolutely. whole initiative. So. I look, that's why I, I wanted to raise the question. I, but they, they do quite a okay. bit of meeting I, I should have asked it then, and I was, for whatever reason, I didn't. So are we inviting the um, 
Mr. Daryl Cruz and the organizations, they've been informed, because I know that that was, I think, at our last meeting, really spelled out clearly that they wanted to be a part of this? Um, as soon as we have the details available where everything is ironed out, we're going to push those out to everybody, and everybody will be invited at the very minimum to the Saturday morning forum, because that's for everybody and everyone to attend. So that's at the minimum. There may be something else that okay. we're, Maybe that we're able in to addition. make happen also. Yeah. Great. Todd, thank you for that update. Should we move on to new business? I'm oh, got Peter, a, I'm sorry. No, no, I've mean, just got a small point sorry. of order. And um, the last meeting, there was a motion on the uh, floor that got tabled, correct. Uh, which was the motion to issue the order. I'm happy to um, defer it again for the next meeting. I did have some questions for uh, Michelle Brooks about the – memo that she sent and I didn't get a chance to reply to Todd and get those questions answered um, so I don't is it is it legitimate to hold that for another month or I think we can we can sort of talk about it now okay and then, I'm and I'm sorry it's not on the agenda I just neglected I, I, to yeah I figured it was just an oversight and I was going through the minutes before and noticed it so um, the more or less the question I had I Michelle's opinion in the memo that you sent us seemed to be that we are under no obligation to reveal these pieces of information and that obviously most um, uh, uh, settlement agreements have confidentiality clauses and therefore some of the information would be problematic to reveal in, in the common case and therefore it would be fine if we didn't. And she gave a minimal list of what we could do if we decided to issue the order. I guess my m main question uh, with regard to it is she seemed to be saying what would minimally meet the law, although she started the memo by saying well, we have to figure out what the plain language is because there is no specific definition of conciliation agreement. One of the things we discussed at last meeting was that the parties were given an opportunity to settle for quite some time before a finding of probable cause was issued. Um, and once that finding was issued, the, uh, I think the, the argument I was making last time was, well, at that point, they've given up some of those rights to confidentiality because they've waited for the probable cause finding. And she didn't really address that in the memo, or at least not as far as I could see. Yeah. Did you have any discussion with her about that? Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, <coughs> that basically, the memo is intended, and what I asked her to sort of write on is what are the what are we required to do as an entity and what the Human Relations Commission and the Human Relations Office uh, in order to be compliant with the law? So that would naturally deal with minimum requirements just as a point of language. Gotcha. And so the rest actually is a matter of policy now. So once we know what we have, what we have to do, the threshold of legality, if you will, then the rest becomes an, a discussion of policy that probably should occur between the Human Relations Commission and my office. Okay, so the I guess the one question she didn't answer for me was, let's say as a question of policy, the Human Relations Commission does want to reveal some of that information that is not minimally necessary. Mm -hmm. I take it, given that she didn't comment on it, that there's nothing that makes it impossible for us to reveal that information? Or did she just not have an opinion on that at this time? Um, I, I would say looking at the memo as it's written, I think that is a correct statement that there's nothing that would necessarily bar the release of that information. The question would probably be, the more cogent question would be, if in the event of a non-concurrence between the Human Relations Office and the Human Relations Commission, whether or not my office could be compelled by the Commission to, to reveal that, that information. information. And I, I that's think that's probably that, the more cogent question. Um, I, I think that's probably worth asking. And as I think most of the, the rest of the Commission can tell, my personal position on this is that once the two parties have gone and pushed the process to require a finding of probable cause one way or the other, that to then 
hide behind confidentiality for a settlement agreement, really they have used the city's time already. They've used the city's resources, and if it took the city's resources to issue that probable cause finding, they've given up their, uh, their expectation of confidentiality on that. And I think it is in the interest of the city and the, the commission to reveal the information of who the parties in, in fact were involved because now, again, a, if they were to have brought the case to the commission for a hearing, those party names would have been revealed. Once that probable cause finding has been issued, I, I think they've lost that right to confidentiality of their identities and of the contents of that settlement agreement. So I, I would like that to be the position of the commission, obviously. So is this a matter that you would want to have sort of a back and forth on with my office now, or do we want to save this and sort of have it be a specific matter for discussion at the next meeting? Uh, I, I mean, I'd be happy to give an opinion. Otherwise, I can, I can write a policy memo that would outline all the reasons that my office and, would strongly advise against that. And, and I'll defer to Dan on when to have that discussion. I, I mean, I think we do have to have it at some point, sure. um, but uh, I, I think we, we do want to establish a policy and then um, we probably want to get legal input into if the commission decides that that's what the the way forward because I'm hearing that at least your office it would prefer not to have that be the policy. Um, My office would strongly advise against that being. Um, the I, I'd like to hear the you know some legal opinion about whether the, um, if that's our policy, the city should be compelled to reveal that information. I'd like to. I'm a little confused when I'm reading this memo on page two, the second full paragraph down she indicates the city and its agents are not parties to any conciliation agreements that may ultimately be executed by the complainant and the respondent that kind of says we don't get all the information well no it says we're not parties to it that means we it, the agreement isn't with the city whatever the settlement agreement is it's between the two parties that are the respondent and the complainant right. it, the city is not so we don't have a stake, according to her, in the agreement. That, that's also why I wanted to push a little further on the plain text language of the ordinance, because it does seem to indicate in the ordinance that the city, once the conciliation agreement is reached, has a bunch of requirements for it to be involved. It has to enforce the conciliation agreement. It has to re review whether or not the conditions have been met. We have to issue an order on the conciliation agreement. So I agree that we are not party to it, but we are certainly involved in it in some way. And that's, I, I wanted I to get, get more that. of the detail. I get that. But when it goes further and it says the only way for the city to be apprised of the terms would be for the party to <coughs> breach a non-disclosure provision. So I, I think what I'm hearing you say, Pete, is we need to really look at the language and how it's spelled out because these two don't match. Well, this a, th this does assume that the uh, that the settlement agreement that was reached has a confidentiality clause. Now, I they presume do. it does. Yeah. Um, and you know there are also some other assumptions that are built it. in. And and part of the problem is again, as we discussed last time, between reality and what's written in the ordinance, um, which is a problem that happens with all laws and all ordinances, um, all statutes. Is that there are aspects of the statute that, that were written or the law that was written back in 1970 or 1980 where there were the, the process may or may not have been established yet and the normal flow of things uh, may not have been known at that time. Right. And, and I think the, the ordinance does have an expectation that once a probable cause finding is made that the city would be involved and the Human uh, Rights Office would be involved, or Human Relations Office, I'm sorry, would be involved in the conciliation agreement. Well, I, I, I mean, I think that's at least the way the language is written. Yeah, the way the language is written, I think the language does make some presumptions about that, but we all know, um, just from a practice standpoint, that if parties choose to go 
outside of the the human relations office in order to conciliate you know it is ultimately on the complainant whether or not the complainant decides to withdraw the complaint so if there is a an offer made in an agreement in principle and they decide to withdraw the complaint as a result of that that agreement in principle then you know it would be very strange for us to try and stand in the way of that and that's part of my position here is that the city has enforcement goals and enforcement priorities that it wants to move forward with in terms of discrimination and enforcing these discrimination laws. But at the, at the base of this are people who cannot afford to hire attorneys who, when they receive these settlements, they need the settlements uh, because they are typically in low wage earning jobs because if they were in higher wage earning jobs then attorneys would take these cases and they would go before IDHR and EEOC <coughs> and if we are in the position of of being able to negotiate five thousand dollars seven thousand dollars for someone who may in their average year make twenty thousand dollars and we decide that based upon a technicality that we're going to run the risk of that not going through because we want to sort of abide by something that we see as some type of technical reading when we know that it goes beyond the legal requirements, that is going to be problematic on a practical level for people, for the people, to the very people that we're trying to help with the ordinance. Peter. So I absolutely understand that concern. And I think it actually flips on its head what the ordinance is getting at. What we don't want to have happen in particular is for, and I've used this example before, not Todd Rent, but Evil Todd happens to be in the human, uh, in the position that you're in. And what we don't want to have happen is agreements being made to squash what the complainant really deserves but and being shoved through. To it they're consenting to the agreement. Assuming that we've got a plaintiff, who, a, a, a plaintiff, a complainant, who is not in a position to afford an attorney to represent themselves, it is quite possible for someone in your office to influence them to take a deal that if it came before a sympathetic commission, we would find for a much greater amount. So are um, you saying that the purpose of the disclosure of the terms of an already settled settlement agreement would be for the commission to come in and dis and sort of serve as a supervisor over that agreement. The the reason, the as as far as it. I can tell, the reason that the text in the ordinance is written the way it is is because remember the complainant brings the complaint, but the city files the the violation, the violation for the hearing if because there is no conciliation. It, if there is no conciliation agreement because it's no longer an issue of the complainant versus the particular party. The concern of the city and the concern of this commission is that we want to make sure that the Stat that the ordinance is being met, not that everybody necessarily is made whole. Obviously, making everybody whole is a great thing, but if we have someone, a, a particular party in town who's employing people, who's consistently discriminating, and one person gets that $5,000, but hundreds of people are damaged, we haven't done anything good by letting that conciliation agreement go through silently if We've already found probable cause that there was potentially some discrimination. I think it's absolutely part of our burden as the commission to make sure that if folks aren't settling things on their own without the influence of the city offices, that we then need to say, okay, if you're going to use the process, we're going to make sure that the process is properly followed. You know, the one last thing I will state on this is I think there may be a misunderstanding in regards to the parties deciding not to settle this before the probable cause hearing or the probable cause determination because nine times out of ten, in fact, more than that, it's not the parties who are deciding not to settle. It is the respondent who's deciding to be intransigent and not settle until they absolutely have to. And oftentimes it is 
the ruling or the the determination itself mm -hmm. and the logic and the evidence that's brought to bear in that determination that is the most effective tool in getting them to the table. I hope you're not saying that in the past you've made probable cause findings and that has caused a conciliation and you haven't brought them to us before. No, what I'm saying is when I look in the record of the past, uh, particularly of the last one and the last probable cause findings that occurred before I got here, what I'm saying is those probable cause findings played an integral role in, in moving the respondent to settlement. Okay, um, I was thinking, should we follow up with maybe some additional questions sure. from Ms. Brooks and or requests? Sure. And I don't know if I want to make her time. Have we seen city office? Could we coordinate it, our annual to make her time worth, you know, or could, could we have her to come to spe specifically address this issue? Or Sure. Okay, yeah, is that absolutely. fine? Yeah. So, and I, I guess just uh, procedurally, uh, uh, as far as order goes, do we uh, again defer the motion to the next meeting? Is is that appropriate? And, and I believe so. Okay. Um, so I, I would ask that the the motion be put on next month's agenda, and we can continue discussion then. Second. Do we need to re-second it or? I'm not exactly sure. I, let's I, do it. Let's be safe. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> oh, so, well. Can some second it and we'll hit discussion? Is that okay, Fran? Sure. Sorry, I'll second not. that. Okay, Fran. Yeah, um, Sorry. Is that um, as long as, as nobody is waiting yeah. on us? We have some time. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Fran. Yeah, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the parties have settled. Yes. Um, uh, it, things have, it, the wheels have been turning while we're deciding what procedurally to do. There, yeah, it's done. So, I mean, it's just a matter of notification at this point. Great. So, um, should we coordinate something as far as a, an, an email or request or send something to you directly, or how would what, you like us to handle that? Or You know, what, what we can do is I'll just get her a copy of this discussion okay. so that she can get an idea of all the nuances. But, again, what I'm going to ask her to speak to are the matters of law. Yeah, the matters lawyer. of policy are are, and I think that's mm -hmm. really where the where the disagreement lay. Okay, so um, right. I, I mean, there's going to be questions of, you know, if, if we disagree on a policy, right. then what what does the law say about what is required, what isn't required, and right. what we can insist on and what we can't. And and ultimately, you know, you all, we could sort of push off the policy discussion again till next time. You could decide at this point whether or not you want to sort of declare a non-concurrence by directing my office to um, to reveal, I guess, or disclose the names of the party participants in the last, or the, in the um, charge that we're discussing specifically. Uh, you could do that, and that would bring it also, that, that would be a pretty efficient way of bringing that. Um, although if you voted not to do that, if you voted to say we don't want the names, then it would die. I mean, we could still, as a hypothetical matter, sort of explore that at the next meeting, but that may be a, an approach to take also. Has does the Brooks memo answered most of our legal? Or do we? Or is there an outstanding legal question? The, I think the outstanding legal question is if the commission decides that it does post uh, probable cause finding want to reveal information more than what is in the memo and the human relations uh, officer is recommending that we do not do that. Um, what are the requirements of the city to reveal that information? Um, can we compel the city to do it on the basis of the ordinance? Um, and, and I think that is an open question. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. For clarity, thank um, And Should we move on to new business? Todd, uh, where would you like us to start with? Sure. Um, sorry. Originally, we had scheduled for Vasilia Clark, Vasilia Clark to be with us this evening. She is under the weather. Sure. So what I'm going to do is very tentatively and pretty quickly take you through 
the report, which is basically a breakdown of hiring. If, as you know, when we're really looking at progress that a company is making, we're looking at how they're filling their open positions. And so this overview breaks down uh, hiring for positions from 2009, 2010, and so far in 2011. Mm -hmm. As you can see, in terms of hires in that time period, about 23% of those hires have been minority hires. Uh, in terms of gender, about 33% have been female. You can see the breakdown in terms of, and I apologize, Elizabeth uh, Borman, who is the uh, assistant personnel manager, actually did this report in color. I'm somewhat cost averse, so I did it in black and white. <laughs> and I realized that really you lose some of the nuance when you look at it. Um, but however, if you look at the table just below the graph, um, it actually lays out the numbers for you quite nicely and redeemingly. So um, you, get a, you get a feel for the amount of minority hire, well, the overall amount of hiring for each department, and then the total number of minorities that have been hired in this period for each department. Now, what I will say is this. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at these numbers is there have been hires that um, I'm aware of that were minority hires that for whatever reason did not ultimately make it onto the report and it was because they were so short in duration, I believe. I did not ask, I didn't have the chance to ask Elizabeth specifically if someone's hired and then they do not make it through the probationary period whether or not they would be seen as part of this report. But I'm aware of at least one example that I would, that I would see in the police department where that would be the case. So um, that, you know, w what you see here are people, I believe, who are hired and are still sort of retained, if that makes any sense. So the next page will show you a breakdown of the 2009 hires. Uh, by department, who we hired, and their their demographic breakdown, the and the subsequent two pages would be 2010 and 2011. The final thing I want to call your attention to is the city workforce profile on the last page. What you'll see here is that 24 percent uh, of our workforce currently uh, is female, 76 male. Um, you'll see that I believe our total for total minorities is right around 11 percent. Um, that's gone down just a little bit um, in the past year, year and a half or so. Um, and then you can also see your breakdown by departments. Can I ask what CD stands for? It's community development. Thank you. Any questions for Todd? Um, well, we saw with the workforce statistics that we got, community development seems to have a problem and seems not to be solving it terribly well, even if you take a look at seasonal hires and rehires in 2011. Um, I, I, I'm not seeing any movement in particular. There was one uh, hire, a regular hire overall. Um, is something in particular being done with regard to community development to figure out what's going on there? You know, we've had an opportunity to sit down and talk with Libby uh, Tyler and sort of go through what would be similar to the compliance template that we have the action plan and sort of go over, it's more of a recruitment plan though. Mm -hmm. um, and we are sort of working with, um, well, we, myself and Vasilia Clark, are currently working with CD in order to sort of try and institute some, make, make sure at least that there are sort of uh, best practices that are going forward. I will tell you, Libby is very involved at the national level uh, in all types of different organizations that are sort of promoting and very devoted to A absolutely I, I mean th that's what's so surprising about those numbers is the folks that I know in community development in Libya in particular know this stuff um, and so you know a sp the the really the one that jumped out at me looking at this was the seasonal hires and rehires um, 
which seems just consistent year over year. And so I'm wondering, you know, th- there's got to be some other thing playing in here, and it would be nice to know what it is. You know, I think we're still sort of looking at that. And, you know, with these reports, it's, it's something that we've looked at sort of in passing before, and now we're having an opportunity to spend some time really focusing on it. And I think a lot of the dynamics that we see at play in the EEO workforce statistics, where we're talking about people who are preferring to work in various regions and whether or not someone, and in this particular instance, you know, asking the question of whether or not someone who is very skilled and trained in or getting a master's level in urban planning is going to prefer working here in Champaign as opposed to working in the suburbs of Chicago, for mm-hmm. instance, or working in the suburbs of Indianapolis. Those, those are questions that we really need to dig into. I mean, we can sort of have some intuitive thoughts about them, but we, we will dig into them. And, and, I, and I would guess that, that those numbers, not guess, I would conjecture that those numbers are going to improve over the next few years because they've been better in the past. It's, it's, the other thing is the department is not particularly large, and when you don't have a huge department, for instance, also in finance, finance is very small. So you have small fluctuations that make a big difference. And, and yeah, I mean, the numbers we're looking at here are twos, threes, fours yeah. a, in terms of numbers of people. It, it's just it, the statistical significance is not, it, it, not going to be there. It's just that... They Looking the same, and and that's surprising. Yeah, and and we we are looking at it, and we will look at it further. Brandon. Do do we have any information? I mean, well, we do, but I'm interested to see information about the kinds of pay scales that we have across these different <laughs> groups. Are they all comparable? Uh, is is, um, the clerk's office, the community development, and the finance and executive departments in particular, are they comparable in terms of of, um, the the pay that these people are getting? I think when you normalize them for or when you factor in uh, length of service, for instance, Mm -hmm. in the police and the fire department, those are going to be dictated by union scale. Right, so that's why. In I public works, so the vast majority, mm-hmm. because when you combine the unionized, which are public works, police, and fire, mm-hmm. that's going to take, you know, I hate to guess, but probably 80% of our workforce right there. So mm-hmm. all of that's sort of set by union rates. So the, the non-union scales, you're going to be looking at, if you again, if you factor in length of service, we can look at that. I'm guessing that there's not going to be that much that that there's not going to be any issue there. Okay, um, has there so the the uh, clerical workers and the uh, people outside fire, police, and public works are not unionized in the in this city. Is it some of the clerical workers are unionized? Okay, um, but the ones that are like for instance the one that would be a clerk worker um, the administrative assistant my administrative assistant mm-hmm. the administrative assistant for the mayor because they're confidential employees they handle confidential information cannot be unionized they're exempt okay they're, or at least they're not unionized i don't mm-hmm. want to say they can't be they mm-hmm. just aren't so yeah so some of the clerical staff would be unionized some would not be for instance mm-hmm. i believe the police service representatives which i technically would be uh, clerical staff are under AFSCME. Are they? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Todd, for providing us with this report. Uh, should we move on to um, discussing our local unions? Yes. Um, I included in your packet a, a apprenticeship guide for the building and construction trades in Champaign County. Uh, and some of the surrounding counties, I believe. Um, I wanted you to sort of get an introduction. Really, when you're talking about making progress and getting more minorities in the trade unions so that when our contractors call the union shops, they can get more minorities, part of the key to that, um, and I should say this, I had an opportunity to meet with Dan McCall, who is the... I should know this right off the top of my head. Um, he is in the Bricklayers Union, and I think he's the president of the Joint 
council of several trades unions. And I apologize, Dan, because I'm messing that up. I should have actually written your credential down. Um, extremely helpful in providing uh, what I would call institutional history. Obviously, it's dealing more with more than one uh, organization, but really a history of Champaign County and unionization or the trade unions and sort of where we are now. Uh, in terms of the apprenticeship programs, because of the way the, the economy has gone, you know, there's been a serious cutback in the amount of apprenticeships that are available. Um, but even with that, there are programs that are geared towards creating opportunities, not just for minorities, but for um, young people who just don't see themselves, you know, going to a four-year institution who really want to work with their hands. Um, and want to work building things and fixing things um, and sort of they're wired that way. One of the things that came up during the course of the conversation is the need for more support, in particular from Urbana, to get Urbana, and by Urbana I mean the entire community, the schools, the city, the, 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 you know, the various entities, more involved in these types of apprenticeship programs. One very startling statistic he told me is that um, they run a summer program that invites young people to come and participate and get trained and you know really get hands-on experience at these trades. And I'm going to get these statistics wrong, but let's just say out of approximately maybe 60 people that applied, you know, maybe 45 of them came from city or something they lived in Champaign in terms of Urbana participation they they got far less than 10 and so one of the conversations that I think we will have ongoing and what I'd like to do is have Eric and um, Peter since we've been sort of dealing with the contractor issue sort of meet with several of these union leaders uh, I'd like to set up a meeting with Dan McCall actually with the three of us so that he can sort of go over this information with all of us. Um, but to figure out places where there could be partnership and collaboration and increasing sort of Urbana's participation as a community so that we can see more of our young people being involved in these trades programs, both minority and not non-minority, maybe particularly minority, but certainly all of them, so that we can get more people funneled into doing good, productive things rather than if I'm not going to college, then, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sort of going to have a life that doesn't have as much access to economic opportunity, when that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So I just wanted to provide this. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I'll probably have more questions than answers at this point, but certainly we're moving forward with those efforts we will begin to meet with union leaders. And again, I think that we should meet with them from a perspective of learning, of trying to understand what is going on, what, how the systems operate, um, and so that we can try to collaborate to try and, again, increase overall participation, but also increase minority participation and female participation in particular. Just one quick question. Uh, just a quick question. Um, a and R Mechanical, the thing that started this mm -hmm. conversation. Which union are, are they among this bunch that uh, that Dan is involved with? Uh, that Dan McCall is involved with. I can get back to you on that. Yeah, I, but, I mean, but he mentioned that during. If you remember during the presentation, the representative from A and R Mechanical mentioned the high schools and the schools and getting more young people involved. Right. So I'm kind of hoping that that it it is one of the unions that are in the bunch. But I just wanted to make sure that. You know, the one union that we happen to have exposure to, and I don't remember which one it was in particular, and whether it's under the auspices of, of this group. So it, that would be good to know. And I, I will say one more thing. It's going to be very important for us to educate ourselves on the rules in terms of closed union shops. Whether or not, in a, in a particular case, because it varies from union to union, whether or not someone can call that union and ask specifically for a minority candidate and have some reasonable success in getting the minority candidate, because that can happen, apparently. Mm -hmm. But in some unions, we all know that it's based upon the last person laid off. Yep. You know, the last person laid off is put at the bottom of the list and you just go through, move through the list. 
So, and some are very, very tightly knit in that way. Some are not so tightly knit in that way. We need to be able to gain an expertise on which are which and so that we can know what we can ask of reasonably of contractors. Absolutely. The guide has about six or seven one sheets for the local unions. Mm -hmm. They're kind of informative. Am I making too much of it? Only one of them contains any element of an EEO statement. I don't know, is that a big deal? Is that indicative of anything? Or am I reading too much into that? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. It's That's something we can ask the individual union. Mm -hmm. I think it's page eight. We ask that of everybody else. Pardon me, page, uh, page nine, the electrician's local 601 has something in their application process. I can't find it in any of the others. Just point it. Now, these are just primarily informational, but right. they're, prime, they're giving a little bit more than that. So, well, we could place to start. We could definitely check into that as we're place going to start. forward. Todd, thank you. Uh, should we move to you know, the officer's report? Or I don't want to. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, got, I keep turning my back to you guys because I'm looking at this computer. <laughs> Eric, sorry, I don't mean. So, so I handed out one loan. Yeah, I'm just ignoring EEO you guys. EEO <laughs> sort of one loan EEO. I think so. Uh, line that deals with Champagne Telephone Company. We just got it in, I think it was yesterday, mm -hmm. and I figured rather than wait another month, let's try to make some Get decisions here. I'm making a one-year recommendation. They've got a total minority representation of 7.5%. Um, you know, certainly that's obviously a flexible recommendation, but there it is. Uh, I'm happy to make a motion to approve Champagne Telephone for one year. At one year, again, they, they get a letter saying yeah. we'd like to see improvement. Yes. Is there a second? A second? Discussion? Uh, I just have to point out that it was kind of amusing uh, that they didn't note that Asia was, uh, that, that India was Asia. part of Asia. And yeah. Yeah, so. Um, they they which is probably part of the education I so process. I, I absolutely size, understood. I and, and I think they probably read Maybe Asian I as East Asian um, instead of including South Asian. But, um, yeah. It, but that's part of the education process of EEO process. So and that's that is good. understandable. Yes. I, so. I like the, 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 um, the number of women and also the way they're, the levels at which they're represented is, is pretty good. Yeah, they're doing, they're doing okay. <laughs> Um, all those in favor of uh, one-year approval, please say aye. Aye. Oppose the same. Awesome. Todd, uh, activity report? Sure. Um, in terms of the substantial contacts, um, you'll see in, since we last met, I believe there have been three. One for employment um, based upon national origin and other. Um, we have an intake meeting scheduled. The other is sort of, it, sometimes it takes me talking to the person in person and sort of feeling through. Certainly this individual is of, a of another national origin. The question is whether or not there are some other sort of cultural issues that may be impacting their treatment. So I don't mean to be evasive in putting the other, I just don't know yet. Um, in terms of, there's, there was one on housing which was race-based. But in that particular instance, we had no jurisdiction based upon geographic location. And then we've had a employment based upon race. Uh, the complainant had a couple of meetings with him, and ultimately um, his employer provided him with a reasonable explanation as to the disparity that he was seeing. So he decided not to pursue the complaint. Since the writing of this report, I've had two other um, contacts. inquiries, yeah, two other contacts. I'll report them on the next one, but one is a um, race-based issue, which um, I'll be sort of moving forward with in the next a week or an so. An employment? Yes, I'm sorry, yes, I I'm sorry. It was a race-based employment issue. The second one was also a race-based employment issue. And so I'll be meeting with those individuals and making determinations from that. Any questions on those? Mm -mm. All right. Thank you for the update. In terms of the actual cases here, we have UC 101009. Um, that should be changed to settlement negotiation.
So I was in the, and, and I will tell you what happens in these cases, as you know, as our general practice, prior to the initial determination, we contact both parties, let them know that we have concluded the investigation and that we are moving forward to the phase where I actually begin to draft the initial determination. Upon doing that, um, you know, they obviously have the choice of whether or not this is sort of their last best chance to resolve it before they get to the issues about which we were talking earlier. Mm -hmm. And in this particular instance, the, the, they've chosen to try and move to settlement. So we're moving on that. So that's changed. In the next two, um, there has been a significant change in the work condition and um, it's prompted settlement negotiation. So it didn't quite make it to the stage I just described. Um, and so I think I, I would guess both of these, in fact, all three of the first ones will be settled by the next time we meet. Um, at least that's my best guess. Um, and then in the third one, we received the request for information, which was huge. Um, I mean, in terms of the response itself, some of them are larger than others. This one was huge. Um, but I've got, I've managed to get through all of that. And so now we're about to send out an interview request. And not to worry, there'll be at least two more on there on here for next time. So we're still moving. Peter, question. Just, just a quick one. Um, with regard to the, your, you inform them that you're starting to draft your initial determination and give them a chance to settle. I, is there a tight timeline on that? I, do, you, do you say to them, look, yeah. I'm willing to uh, put this on pause yeah. if you're going to continue discussing, no, but for I X them, long? I tell them when I plan on having it completed. I project that I'm going to have this completed by next Friday or whatever. So perhaps if, if you are going to do something last minute, it might be a good time to yeah, do so. Yeah, because once I, once I do it, I've done it. If, if I'm not going to have to do the work, I'd rather <laughs> them tell me at that point. Exactly. No doubt. Um, Let's see. Move um, to the budget report? Yeah, or? the budget report, just wanted to note, I think Tony may have highlighted this in your copies, that the, the big expense was CUIHA, unfortunate CU. What CUIHA? Yeah, CUIHA. Um, that we've had that expense, it's the $1,200 that we normally contribute. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be at the program, but I heard that it went very well. Um, and so, any questions on that? Looks good. Thank you again for that update as well. Any questions? Awesome. Anything else for us, Todd? I well, don't believe so. Anyone have any announcements for the public or our commission? Well, I, I will announce that <coughs> it appears that we have one opening. It appears that we may end up with two, and so I just wanted to sort of make the announcement that certainly if anyone's interested in joining the Human Relations Commission, uh, they can make application at, via the mayor's office. Thank you. Peter. Do we have an open student position still, or? Yes, I believe we do. And what I need to do is find the new Grace, because obviously Grace is retired, so. I know who she is. I'm sorry. Yolande Cook. Is Yolande the, Cook? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think so. I think um, she was a school social worker in Champaign and just recently went back to Urbana High School. Is that what you're looking for? Exactly. That's what I thought of. Any other announcements? All righty. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Good night, Urbana.